Welcome back. Tom Hartman here with you. On the line with us is Professor Richard Wolf, the economist, co-founder of Democracy at Work, author most recently of Capitalism and Crisis Deepens, Essays on the Global Economic Meltdown. His website's uh, democracyatwork.info and rdwolf.com with two Fs. And you can tweet him at Prof Wolf with two Fs. Professor, welcome back to the program. Thank you, Tom. I'm glad to be here, even if it's by my cell phone. Yeah, it's always great having you with us. Uh, th there's a, a piece over at Naked Capitalism titled America's Subprime Economy, which suggests that the economic uh, growth of the last two years in particular, uh, but uh, it's, you know, the kind of the peak of a growing trend has been driven instead of being driven by spending at the top 60 percent of the economy, which I guess is normal. Um, it's being driven by the bottom 40 percent and that those people in the bottom 40 percent of the economy are borrowing in order to accomplish that, which suggests to me that they've kind of hit the point after, you know, what, a decade out from the financial crisis, the Bush crash, where they've run out of everything that they could do. Uh, in, and now they've got to resort to borrowing to maintain their standard of living. And that seems to me like a really, really dangerous, like heading for the cliff kind of thing. I'm curious, your thoughts on this, or am I exaggerating the importance of this? No, no. If anything, I would argue that you, uh, you're you being modest or moderate in what you have to say. Uh, and here's my reasoning. The 2008 crash was a cataclysmic blow to all the people that had borrowed money in the years leading up to that. And we're talking about the 1990s, at least, back even into the 1980s, when wages stopped rising in the United States, which happened at the, in the, during the 1970s, the American dream still was in the minds of the American working people. And since you couldn't get more wages to buy that increasingly pricey American dream, you went into debt. And, you know, it doesn't take a genius to understand that if the 1990s and early into this century, uh, you borrowed more and more on a basically stagnant real income, this is an unsustainable arrangement. You will eventually have more debt that you can service. And that's what happened in 2007 and 8. And it left a terrible uh, fear in the minds of the American working class to ever let themselves get loaded up again with that kind of debt. So that when the, the report that you just summarized comes out, people who, who understand this realize that the American working people must, again, be at a point of desperation, not just to borrow when they can't do anything else, but to borrow when it's in their fresh memory how terribly dangerous that was. So it's a perfect indicator of the stress level of this economic system that just below the veneer of the hype of everything being fine that you get from the government. Yeah, what I'm seeing is that the non-housing debt of, of American consumers, that would be credit card debt, car loans, uh, but not, not mortgages, but the non-housing and uh, student loans uh, was at as low as 16% in 1992, and it's been climbing steadily, and it's particularly exploded since uh, 2012. And it's now uh, uh, over 26 percent. So that's you know 16 percent to 26 percent as uh, an, that's as a, right. It's an enormous reliance of the uh, of the mass of people on this debt for which there is no basically no collateral. The, the student debt, the uh, the car debt, the uh, credit card debt, and so forth. And it's a sign. It's a sign of desperation that the, the savings have been used up, if there were any. Um, and the basic cost of living in America at this time is such that it, unless you're willing to, to live at a drastically reduced standard of living, you load up on debt. And I want to remind everyone, we now know that the so-called boom of the 1980s and 90s, of which Bill Clinton used to speak so proudly, was a boom based on debt, on a crescendo of debt. And it proved to be as dangerous as that always is. To be aware now that we're going into the same sequence ought to make people's heads explode, or at least some kind of national debate. And let me add one more thing. We are now going into an extravagant expansion of government debt right alongside, because the tax cut, 
the Trump tax cut of December 2017 uh, is now showing up as a front page story on today's New York Times is showing up as a drastic uh, worsening of the deficit of the government. So the government's loaded up in debt and the population is loading up in debt. This is a story whose ending we've seen all too often, and it's an ending that ought to make people tremble. Mm. Meantime, we have uh, Axios reporting that while, uh, as a consequence of the GOP tax scam, the, this, this giant tax cut, corporations uh, took home massively more pay than pretty much anybody else, corporate CEOs, excuse me. Uh, and, and, and the average worker's income over the last two years has actually declined a little bit. That's right. And, and, and if you understand how these flows work, you can be even more taken aback. Here's how it works. In December of 2017, I mean, this, this was going on before, but here's how much worse it's got. In December 2017, you cut corporate taxes from 35% to 21%. Now, over the last six months, these corporations have been generating wild amounts of spendable cash because they don't have to pay billions in taxes they used to pay. Well, what have they done? Created a lot of jobs? Not at all. They have mostly used it to do what's called stock buybacks. They use the money they don't pay in taxes to go into the market and buy the shares of their own companies. Why do they do that? Because the pay packages of the CEOs and the other top officials are linked to the value of the commodity of the stocks in, in the stock market. So they use the money the government doesn't collect in taxes, go into the stock market, drive up the share value of their company, and then use that increased share value to draw in billions, with a B, of extra corporate pay. Uh, and that's what that Axios article does and what other research shows. So this has been a, a, a double bonanza. First, they get their taxes cut, and now they can boost their salaries into the stratosphere of millions of dollars by pouring that money into the stock market, which, by the way, is what Trump and the GOP said would not happen, that jobs would be created. Nothing of the sort has been uh, achieved. Those jobs that have been uh, created are in the service sector, pay the least amount of money, and therefore can't affect the larger economic system in the way that they had predicted. So it, this is a perfect storm, and as I said, this cannot end well. Yeah, and and I would add that you know prior to the Reagan presidency, this was this form of of uh, corporate manipulation and the whole stock stock buybacks as compensation was illegal, and it yeah, was. And by, it, go ahead. Yeah, I would just add another thing that ought to frighten people. More and more, the stock, the Securities and Exchange Commission filings are showing that these corporate executives, having driven up the shares of of the stock in the way I described by using money they used to pay in taxes are cashing out. That is, they're taking these enhanced value shares and selling them in the market because they themselves see that this can't end well. And so it's better to unload those shares now rather than risk them uh, being in your portfolio when the reckoning comes uh, the way it did in 2008 and nine when shares lost you know, half their value in a matter of weeks. The anxiety level, even of those in charge and who are riding this tiger, the anxiety level ought to be a warning to all of us. Yeah. So, uh, you know, in our last minute or three here, what, what, uh, how do you see this ending? Number one, you, you mentioned a couple of times, I don't see this ending well. Uh, what can people do about that? And what can people do b more broadly about fix or what should we be doing to fix the economy? Well, you know, again, in, in the two minutes that, that, that we might have for this, uh, I think the best I can say to that question is you, we have got to learn as a nation to think differently about this issue from the way we have. This is not going to be fixed by a, a, a different interest rate from the Federal Reserve or a new law passed by Congress or even a change of president from Trump uh, to something else that, that's less crazy. We're dealing with, a, with an underlying economic system that doesn't work, that's run out of gas, and there has to be a debate 
about what kinds of much more basic changes than we've been willing to look at in this country are necessary so that we don't go from pillar to post, from one crisis to another, worrying all the time the way we've just done for the last 15 minutes about how and when the next perfect storm is going to uh, overwhelm us. We've had a 50-year period of, of cheerleading for the capitalist system we have. It's time we grew up as a nation, matured, asked the hard questions about a system that works this way, and then really face the question and debate it, can we do better than this system? I'm one of those who's convinced we can, but I don't want to force it on anybody. I just want us to have the courage as a nation to realize these difficulties that you and I discuss and have that debate finally as we should have. Remarkable. Congress, uh, excuse me, uh, <laughs> Professor Richard Wolf. Professor Wolf, thanks so much for being with us. Thank you, Tom. I'm glad for the opportunity. And I hope in, in future weeks we can continue to talk about what those solutions might be. Professor Richard Wolf, uh, you can tweet him at uh, democracy at WRK or at Prof Wolf with two Fs. Uh, his website, democracyatwork.info and rdwolf with two Fs.com.